tonight. France decides. National rallies strong lead in France's parliamentary first round signals potential for a historic upset. Visa votes. Australia doubles international student visa fees and tightens rules amid soaring migration and housing pressures. Biden cornered. Biden's campaign goes into full damage control mode after a challenging debate performance, working to mitigate fallout and restore confidence. And swift rescue. Over 100 dolphins stranded on Cape Cod Beach, rescued by the International Fund for Animal Welfare. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and thank you for taking the time to join us tonight on World News. For the start of the week, we've got a number of key updates to stories that developed over the weekend and we start off with updates in France. Exit polls show that Le Pen's far-right National Rally Party has taken the lead in the first round of France's parliamentary elections. After unusually high turnouts, the National Rally Party and its allies won 33.2% of the vote, while the left-wing New Popular Front came second with 28%. Meanwhile, Emmanuel Macron's ensemble alliance slumped to a dismal third with 20.76%. Exit polls showed that Marine Le Pen's far-right National Rally Party won the first round of parliamentary elections in France on Sunday, but the final result will depend on days of hard bargaining before the second round of voting next week. Sunday's outcome is a major blow to President Emmanuel Macron, who stunned the nation when he called for snap elections after his party was trounced by the National Rally Party in European Parliament elections earlier this month. In a speech to supporters Sunday night, Le Pen said her party's victory was decisive. My dear compatriots, democracy has spoken, and the French people have placed the national rally and its allies on top, and have practically wiped out President Macron's party. The results were in line with opinion polls ahead of the election, but provided little clarity on whether Le Pen's anti-immigrant Eurosceptic party will be able to form a government and coexist with pro-EU Macron after next Sunday's second round of voting is concluded. A week of tough political decisions now lies ahead. In the past, center-right and center-left parties have teamed up to keep the national rally from power, but that dynamic is less certain than ever. A longtime pariah, the far-right national rally is now closer to power than it has ever been. Le Pen has sought to clean up the image of her party, Known for racism and anti-Semitism, her efforts appear to have worked amid voter anger at Macron, the high cost of living, and growing concerns over immigration. And now we have some updates in the local region for you as the weather takes a turn for the worse. Following heavy rain yesterday, many parts of India experienced severe water logging, forcing residents to use boats for commuting. The rainfall also led to waterlogged streets and traffic disruptions. Residents took to social media platforms to share visuals of the downpour and to voice their concerns about the state of the road. The situation in Moradabad has become dire due to a lack of proper drainage, causing annual submergence during the rainy season. The India Meteorological Department has forecasted further rain in the region, with expectations of light to moderate showers accompanied by thunderstorms. As Moradabad continues to grapple with the impact of heavy rainfall, both the authorities and residents are hopeful for improved rainwater management to prevent future severe waterlogging incidents. And we're over in Australia now as the latest move by the Australian government to rein in record migration that has intensified pressure on an already tight housing market. The country announced that it had more than doubled the visa fee for international students. Australia has more than doubled the cost from 710 Australian dollars to 1600 Australian dollars. This new fee structure, effective from today, aims to manage the record migration numbers that have exacerbated the housing market pressures. Furthermore, 
Recent regulations prohibit visitor visa holders and students with temporary graduate visas from applying onshore for a student visa. Home Affairs Minister stated that the changes coming into force today will help restore integrity to Australia's international education system and create a migration system that is fairer, smaller and better able to deliver for the country. In addition to the fee hike, the government is closing existing loopholes that allow foreign students to extend their stay in Australia continuously. This move adds to a series of policy changes since late last year aimed at tightening student visa rules. The removal of COVID-19 restrictions in 2022 has contributed to a substantial increase in annual migration. We're in Japan now with some economic updates. Japanese authorities are facing renewed pressure to stem sharp declines in the yen as traders focus on the interest rate divergence between Japan and the United States. Several political contests are also taking place against the backdrop of economic concerns as the Japanese yen has fallen to its weakest level against the US dollar since 1986. For more on this, we have other than the world news, special correspondent Rasa Chandradasa from Tokyo in Japan. What's it looking like so far, Rasita. It's a rainy, gloomy day today, and it pretty much sums up the situation of the Japanese yen, which actually hit the lowest value versus dollar uh, since 1986, so it's 38 year low versus dollar, which was 161. And this weekly yen makes the inflation is a very tricky problem. It's not just the Japanese government or the Minister of Finance is doing nothing against that. I mean, they have done a few inter interventions to make the game stronger. But the biggest problem in Japan is the, the, the interest rates. The difference between the interest rates of Japan and the US, while the US keep it for 5.5 or 6 percent, the Japan, the, the Japan keeps the interest rate like uh, in lower 0 to 1 percent. So that makes uh, the dollar investment is, uh, is a healthy. Uh, investment decision for the investors and even the general public. So with the weaker yen and the inflation is becoming an issue here, especially uh, in the imports as well as the, uh, the, the gasoline prices, the Prime Minister Kishida having an election here can't ignore these facts. So he has taken a few measures to support the consumers like he is giving away some taxes from this month and is also subsidizing, subsidizing the electricity and the gas bills from the probably starting from this month. And we also have a good news uh, from the Japanese Trade Ministry, where the Japan uh, Trade Minister, which is uh, similar to the Commerce Minister of the uh, US, had a trilateral uh, meeting with the US and the South Korean counterparts, and they had a joint declaration uh, which covers pretty much a wide range of topics from trade, uh, from AI, semiconductors, and also a regional cooperation. And the timing of this meeting is very interesting because this happened after Mr. Putin, the Russian powerful president, visited North Korea, which is actually the namesake of both Japan and South Korea. And even though the South Korea has some closer relationship with China, this actually trilateral meeting sent some signals to both China and Russia saying that both Japan and the South Korea are in the US sphere and their cooperation uh, cannot be uh, lightly uh, considered lightly forward. All right, thank you very much for the continued updates. That was Other Than a World News Special Correspondent Rasat Chandadasa from Tokyo in Japan. An update from the Ukraine-Russia conflict for you now. Russia claimed two more East Ukrainian villages as its forces have had the upper hand over Kyiv on the battlefield for months. Moscow has claimed new villages in the east of Ukraine regularly for weeks as outgunned and outmanned Ukrainian forces struggled to hold them back. A weekend attack in broad daylight that has left residents of Vilnyansk in shock. As rescue teams deal with the destruction, Locals in the southeastern Ukrainian town mourn their neighbours and, for some, their livelihoods. Two children were among the dead and over 30 people were injured as missiles hit shops and a residential building. The attack on Vilnyansk came hours after Moscow said a Ukrainian drone hit a house in a Russian border village and killed five people. Further east on the front in Donetsk, four people were killed. 
Whilst in the central Ukrainian city of Dnipro, rescuers still dig through the remains of a nine-story building. The series of deadly attacks over the weekend has renewed Kyiv's call for international support, as President Zelensky appealed to allies to help stop Ukraine's depleting arsenal. Clear decisions are needed to help protect our people. Long-range strikes and modern air defense are the foundation for stopping the daily Russian terror. In recent weeks, fighting has intensified on several fronts, as Moscow steps up air raids and attacks on numerous locations along the vast 1,000-kilometer front line, leaving Ukraine on the back foot. Let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. And on the road to the White House tonight, the fallout from the first presidential debate continues. President Biden spent the weekend at Camp David with his campaign, announcing it has raised more than $33 million since the debate. However, questions about the president's age and mental fitness still persist. Tonight, President Biden with his family at Camp David as Democrats try to chart a path forward following his dismal and worrying debate performance. Congressman Jamie Raskin saying there's a world where Biden is not the party's nominee, but Biden himself would have to choose to step aside. But other Biden allies offering a more full-throated defense. The Biden campaign arguing that if the president were to drop out, it would lead to, quote, weeks of chaos on the convention floor. Republicans already tying senators up for re-election to Biden's debate performance. Former White House chief strategist for President Trump and his close confidant, Steve Bannon, predicting Trump will win in a landslide. And as Monday dawns on the U.S., Trump prepares to face his legal troubles. The Supreme Court is expected to hand down its final opinions on the term resolving the question of whether former President Donald Trump may claim immunity from federal election subversion charges. Overstepping their unofficial end-of-June deadline by just a single day, the nine justices will assemble on the bench for a final time before rising for their summer recess, likely leaving in their wake a flurry of legal wrangling over their last decisions. Trump has argued that without immunity, presidents could be hamstrung in office, always fearful of being second-guessed by a zealous prosecutor after leaving the White House. That position appeared to have some purchase on the 6-3 conservative Supreme Court during oral arguments back in April. The answer to the question could have profound implications for both Trump and future presidents. During the first presidential debate just last week, Trump claimed President Joe Biden could also be a convicted felon with all the things that he has done, end quote. The turbulent times at Boeing continue as the U.S. Justice Department plans to criminally charge the aviation giant for breaching the terms of a previous agreement that had permitted the company to avoid prosecution for two fatal plane crashes in 2018 and 2019. Boeing will have one week to either plead guilty or face a trial. Boeing is set to face criminal charges over fraud following the two fatal crashes of its 737 MAX jets some years ago. Sunday that the US Department of Justice had decided on the course of action. There was no comment on the report from officials or the company. The deadly crashes took place in 2018 and 2019, killing 346 people. They were later traced to a design flaw in the jets, which has since been fixed. Boeing agreed a deferred prosecution deal, which shielded it from criminal charges. That was in return for compensating victims' families and taking steps to improve compliance. But in January this year, a mid-air blowout on another MAX jet revived concern over how well the planes are made. Prosecutors subsequently concluded that Boeing had not honoured the terms of the deferred prosecution deal, something the company disputes. Now Boeing will reportedly have until the end of the week to plead guilty or face a trial. It is expected to see a new financial penalty and will have to submit to independent monitoring. 
Pleading guilty may not be an attractive move for the firm, which is also a big maker of military aircraft and other defence gear. Companies with felony convictions can face restrictions on government contracts, though it's possible a plea deal could include terms that avoid such an outcome. Iran's presidential election has proceeded to a runoff, featuring a moderate lawmaker competing against a protege of the supreme leader. Neither candidate is anticipated to bring significant changes for Iran as the Ayatollah retains ultimate authority over crucial matters such as the country's nuclear program and support for militant groups. Iran's presidential election has gone to a runoff, where a moderate lawmaker will stand against a protege of the supreme leader. It came down to a tight race between a low-profile lawmaker, Masoud Pazeshkian, the sole moderate in a field of four candidates, and former Revolutionary Guards member Saeed Jalili. The Islamic Republic's Interior Ministry said on Saturday that no candidate had secured enough votes, and a second round will be held on July 5th. Turnout in Friday's election hit a historic low of about 40 percent, based on an Interior Ministry count. Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei had called on voters to turn out, hoping to boost the legitimacy of the clerical establishment. But there's widespread discontent over economic hardship and restrictions on political and social freedom. Many Iranians have mocked the vote on X with the hashtag election circus. Pezesh Kian, though faithful to Iran's theocratic rule, has publicly criticized authorities over the death of Massa Amini, an Iranian Kurdish woman whose death in custody sparked mass unrest in Iran in 2022. He also favors detente with the West, while Jalili is staunchly anti-Western. Neither candidate is expected to usher in significant shifts for Iran, because Khamenei calls the shots on major issues, like Iran's nuclear program and support for militant groups Hamas and Hezbollah. But the next president would run the government and affect the tone of domestic and foreign policy, and could even influence the succession to Khamenei. Let's take a short commercial break now. More world news right after this. Welcome back. In a massive rescue response, agencies and volunteers alike rushed to save over 100 dolphins stuck in shallow waters off the coast of Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Organizers say this was the largest stranding event that they have ever seen. Here are just a few of the 125 dolphins that got stuck Friday after the tide dropped, struggling in shallow water. With time running out, a massive response. Volunteers armed with life jackets diving in to help, surrounding each dolphin, herding them out to deeper water. Others using boats to bring them out, and some doing triage, dousing the dolphins with buckets filled with water, and even using wet bed sheets to keep them cool. More than 100 dolphins were saved. The International Fund for Animal Welfare is leading the rescue effort. And that concludes our coverage here at World News for tonight. Be sure to tune in again tomorrow for more important updates from across the globe. Stay with us as Sina Mayadine will be joining you shortly with the nightly business report. Thank you very much for watching. Have a good night.